But just a few key times in your life that I'd just like to go over again and just chat to you about. And, and the first was, well, was the first was the one that captured my imagination in the Lotus 48 at Thruxton. And I was thinking on, as we, as I came here, that that was the car in which Jim Clark lost his life. I mean, A, that puts some of the chronology in place, the Lotus 48. Yeah. I know it was, it was three or four years on from then. But what was that car like to drive? What, what sort of car was the Lotus 48 Formula 2 car? Well, first of all, I remember the day clearly when Jim Clark lost his life. And it seemed to me that if he could die in a racing car, then any racing driver was vulnerable. And I was driving from Belfast to my family home. The radio was playing in an MGB with a hard top on it, a factory hard top, not on a set. And just the news broke and it was just devastating. So, what was it, 68, then went to Thruxton, 1969. Jerry Kinane, who was a, a garage owner in Belfast, but who had been a long-time Lotus fan, went to Chapman and bought the two remaining Lotus 48 chassis, the Graham Hill car and the Jackie Oliver car, and the old transporter, and trundled them all back over to Northern Ireland. And the cars were then rebuilt in Jerry's workshop, just off the Falls Road. So you know, in Belfast, you've got two principal roads, the Shankill Road and the Falls Road, and both are very related to religious interests. But Jerry and Fred Smith, who was his business partner, rebuilt both cars. They were entered for Thruxton. We turned up. Uh, Jerry had done a deal with a plug manufacturer, and for some reason, on the first day of practice, and we just misfired, we couldn't get rid of it. But we had a set of the original plugs that came with the engines, which were, uh, I think, Autolite plugs, put them back in, and the misfire was cured. <laughs> and started the race, uh, or the heats, or whatever they were, and then got into the final. And then I find myself just bit by bit catching cars and overtaking cars. And some of those drivers were people that I had read about. Some of them were Formula One drivers. They were, I never imagined coming from my background in Northern Ireland, that I could enter a race in a car that had a sullied reputation because of Jim Clark's accident. I, I thought it was a very nice car. But remember, it was the first time I'd driven a racing car with aerodynamics. It had wings on it, which was something I was completely uh, unfamiliar with. And uh, we went through the race gradually, and I ended up having an accident through principally inexperience. But what it... it enabled me to do was to illustrate or showcase the, the the raw talent that I had and it helped me then go forward to fulfill the the dream of wanting to be a professional racing driver and up until that point th I'd never had a benchmark to make that a bit, that assessment with what Formula 2 provided and you, you've alluded to is the opportunity for the up and coming the drivers coming out of Formula 3 or in my case coming from club racing level in Ireland to go into an international event and compete against Grand Prix drivers. And, I mean, that doesn't exist. The only way a, a young driver can get to race with a current Grand Prix driver is at a Grand Prix, or maybe at best go and do a test. Whereas with Formula 2, it gave us the chance to be measured against the known quantity of the current driver of that period, and therefore people could say, well, Ronnie Peterson or Emerson Fittipaldi or Tim Schenken or whoever is... A given quantity, and we can know we know that because we have measured them against Jackie Stewart, Jack Brabham, Jochen Rint, Jackie Eakes, the star Grand Prix drivers of that generation. I think that's one of the sad aspects that uh, motor racing has evolved into: that the drivers that are the future talent in Formula One aren't allowed to be exposed to the existing Grand Prix talent. John, um, you had a huge accident at Brands Hatch in the Brabham. And I believe recently you were yes. comparing notes with, with Mark Webber yeah, and his yeah. bicycle accident. Can you tell us a little bit about that conversation went? Well, we were both going to the opening of the Red Bull Ring in Austria, the old Österreich circuit. And Adrian Newey, uh, Christian Horner and Mark, we all went in the Red Bull plane, conveniently for me, out of the Oxford airport. And uh, at some point in the conversation we came to the subject of compound fractures of lower limbs. And, of course, Mark had a, a nasty accident on a bicycling event uh, and had a compound fracture. So I said, hold on a second, mate, rolled up my trouser leg, pulled the sock down and said, look at that. What do you think of that one? Oh, mate, what of that? How'd have you know? And I explained. He said, what, you mean compound fracture? Bones sticking out of the skin? I said, both of them, Mark. 
And they said, God, you know, it's so dangerous. And I said, well, well, explain what you mean. Well, because the whole thing of a compound fracture is, of course, of the bones exposed, but principally the bone marrow, the potential for cross-contamination and getting an embolism, as we know tragically from Ronnie Peterson's accident in 1978 at Monza, is very real. I didn't maybe appreciate it at the time, and Mark was certainly very much more lucid about it than I would have been because he'd been put through a different, different medical procedure. I don't know if I was given anticoagulant drugs, drugs when I was taken to hospital or whether it was just divine guidance or something that I avoided that. But so he said, well, what, when, when did you get into a car? When was your first drive? Almost like it was a competition between the pair of us as to who was in a car and racing competitively before the other. I, I suspect it was probably me because my accident occurred in March and I had a full season ahead of me when I recovered, whereas Mark's occurred at the end of the season and he was in downtime, so he had, he had a different recovery path. We both recovered, I think, pretty quickly and it just goes to show if you've got a will to recover that makes the body do its job that much more quickly. John, the word incredible springs to mind, but it's not incredible because we all know that it happened, but it is fabulous if that maybe let's choose that word that you won a grand prix for roger penske in the penske yeah. team and, and perhaps some of our younger viewers don't know that but the significance of that i think gathers weight as time goes on and we see the gravitas of roger and what he's achieved and and your contribution at the time just amazing and, and a lovely time for you as, as well i guess even though it was tainted by marks yes i mean I, tragedy has maybe been helpful to me because Bert Hawthorne, a uh, New Zealand driver, died in Alan McCall's Tui Formula 2 car and I then got the opportunity when Alan rebuilt the team to drive for that and then in 75 Mark had his accident at the Oosterreich ring in what was effectively the Penske PC3, uh, F it was a March clone, a freak accident but most accidents in many ways are freaks. But over the 75 season, I did contact with the team, principally with Heinz Hofer, who was the, the team principal or team manager. And Roger at that period was also heavily involved in motor racing in America, both in terms of USAC and NASCAR. had gone into NASCAR. And, I mean, Roger's business program, let alone his motor racing program, would just drive anybody mad. It's just so extensive. And then his entry into Formula One meant that he was making international flights from North America to wherever the, the Grand Prix venue is. And he had to be rational and, and realistic about all that. But it was uh, an opportunity at the end of 75 uh, for the final race at Watkins Glen. I was able to leave John Surtees, who I'd driven for that year, and f do the final Grand Prix. And then for 76, we had a full year. And it was a wonderful team. It was a wonderful team because of Roger's enthusiasm and motivation and you know just that whole aspect of being, I mean, he's, a, 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 he's like a nuclear power station. His power just s doesn't stop generating. And uh, and the team based down in Poole, down in Dorset, unusual place for a team to be based, but that was the, the location they chose. And a nucleus of, of people, Heinz obviously, Jeff Ferris, Derek Walker, Pete Parrott, many people still involved in motor racing, particularly in, in the States. Uh, maybe a team of 10 people altogether. I mean, a Formula One team of 10 people with a budget wherein the sponsor got a huge number of bangs for his bucks. Again, part of the, you know, Roger's philosophy about the presentation of any particular formula that he happened to be involved in, the visual aspect as well as the professional aspect, and both visually and in terms of preparation, his cars, I think, were the, the, the class of the field. And what's your relationship like with Roger today? I haven't seen Roger for a long time, and, I mean, frankly, he's such a busy man. But ironically... He is probably now I think, the largest motor dealer or the motor dealer group in Great Britain. And literally less than a mile from my house is a part of his motor dealership empire with a Jaguar, a Lexus and a Saab dealership, literally less than a mile up the road. And I know that from time to time when he's doing one of these whirlwind trips of his UK bases, he goes there. But it's, it's such a tight schedule. He doesn't know I live literally down the road and... Uh, He's just on such a tight schedule. I mean, he gets off the flight, flies in privately, gets off the flight, immediately into the dealerships and other businesses he has here, and it's over and done with. Then he's off to Germany to do something else. And well, let's hope after this 
we film this that he does know it's here and, and you can have lunch well I think it, the history of Formula 1 for Roger was very brief and the, the one of the biggest disappointments for him and I know for me was the night at the end of 76 towards the end of the year when I had a phone call literally in the middle of the night from Roger to explain that he had to say rationalise and cut back on his schedule he couldn't physically do what he was doing and at the same time he was in the middle of growing this enormous business empire that he's created so the thing that was going to be the expendable part was Formula One and again at the same time it was the end of the single car teams for the 77 season onwards I think it was mandated that Formula One had to be a two car team effort and that meant a massive expansion it meant an uplift in sponsorship it meant in a sense, the, the control of the, formula, of, of the Formula One team was going to be even further removed from Roger's day-to-day -day involvement. And therefore, his role was going to be maybe a different role to that that he had enjoyed in that two-year period using Formula One.